Hola, muy buenos días a todos y bienvenidos a esta sesión informativa de la OPS sobre la pandemia por COVID-19 en la región de las Américas, este miércoles 5 de mayo del 2021. Soy Sebastián Oliel del Departamento de Comunicación de la OPS y esta sesión, como todas las semanas, durará alrededor de una hora. Y estaremos tomando preguntas de ustedes hasta ese momento. Ya hemos recibido preguntas por correo electrónico y también podrán enviar sus preguntas por el QIA y hacerlas en vivo. Recuerden incluir su nombre y medio de comunicación al enviarnos sus preguntas. Eh, también les cuento que contamos con interpretación simultánea al inglés, portugués y francés y pueden optar por cualquiera de ellas haciendo clic en el botón Interpretation. Hoy la directora de la OPS, la doctora Carissa Etienne, informará sobre la evolución de la pandemia en la región, sobre cómo la COVID-19 está afectando a adultos de todas las edades y también sobre la situación de ocupación de las unidades de cuidados intensivos en los países de la región. Acompañan a la doctora Etienne en la sesión de hoy el doctor Jarbas Barbosa, subdirector de la OPS, el doctor Ciro Ugarte, director de Emergencias en Salud de la OPS, y el doctor Silvana Aldigueri, gerente de Incidente para COVID-19 en la OPS. Ahora sí, entonces, quisiera invitar a la doctora Etienne a que nos comparta sus palabras de apertura de esta sesión. Doctora Etienne. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Good morning, and I wish to thank you for joining today's press briefing. Over the last week, More than 1.3 million people were infected with COVID in the Americas, and more than 36,000 died from COVID-related complications. Nearly 40% of all global COVID deaths reported last week took place right here in our region. Today, More Latin American countries than ever before are reporting more than 1,000 COVID cases a day. And our hospitals are fuller than ever. We are still in the midst of an ongoing crisis. Canada is continuing to report significant jumps in infections in highly populated provinces as Ontario, as well as in less populated territories of the North and Yukon, which are home to remote and indigenous communities. Puerto Rico and Cuba remain significant drivers of COVID cases in the Caribbean, although infections are also on the rise in many smaller islands. Anguilla, for example, has reported nearly 70% of its total COVID cases in just the last 10 days. And in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, cases are increasing among internally displaced people following the recent eruption of the La Sufre volcano. In Central America, Guatemala is seeing significant spikes in cases and Costa Rica is reporting record high infections. Across both countries, Hospitals are full of patients, most of them under 70 years of age. Cases are rapidly accelerating in the Guyanas and across Argentina and Colombia, where weekly case accounts are five times higher than they were this time last year. Hospitals are reaching capacity in Colombia's metropolitan cities and death rates have jumped by more than a quarter over the last week. Despite all that we've learned about this virus in a year, our control efforts are not as strict and prevention is not as efficient. And we are seeing what happens when these measures are relaxed. COVID spreads, cases mount, our health systems become overwhelmed and people die. It's an eerily familiar picture, but one thing does look different now, and that is the patients themselves. 
for much of the pandemic, our hospitals were filled with elderly COVID patients, many of whom had pre-existing conditions that made them more susceptible to severe disease. These trends created a false sense of security among the younger populations who, while fearful of the virus, were not concerned about severe disease. But look around the intensive care units now across our region, and you will see that they are filled not only with elderly patients, but also with younger people. Over the last few months, hospitalization rates among those under 39 years increased by more than 70% in Chile. In Brazil, the highest jumps in hospitalizations have been among people in their 40s. In some areas of the United States, more people in their 20s are now being hospitalized for COVID-19 than people in their 70s. Adults of all ages, including young people, are becoming seriously ill, and many of them are dying. In Brazil, mortality rates have doubled among those younger than 39. It has quadrupled among those in their 40s and tripled for those in their 50s between December 2020 and March 2021. This is tragic, and the consequences are dire for our families, our societies, and our future. The time is overdue to adjust our response, and countries must be prepared for what's in store. Our region did a remarkable job expanding hospital capacity in 2020. Colombia, Panama, and the Dominican Republic doubled their ICU bed capacity, while Chile and Peru have tripled theirs, and Mexico and Honduras nearly quadrupled their capacities in just a year's time. But still, hospitals across the Americas are dangerously full. With proper care and treatment, Young people are more likely to survive COVID infections, but hospitalizations can take weeks, and therefore countries must be prepared for a surge in demand. If infections continue to rise at this rate, we expect that over the next three months, countries across our region will need to maintain and even increase their ICU bed capacity further. Health workers also need support after operating in a crisis mode for so long. Where gaps exist, countries need to hire and train more and more specialized health personnel to ensure that every patient is receiving the high quality of care that they deserve. But we also cannot expand ICU capacity indefinitely. There are simply not enough health workers to hire and to train in, in time. So this points us back to the best option. We must all recommit to a comprehensive response that is grounded in prevention and maintaining healthcare for COVID-19 and other conditions. Just as it was last year, our common goal should be to bring down this epidemic curve. We know what it takes to get there. Social distancing, the wearing of masks, avoiding gatherings in closed spaces are the key to reduce transmission, especially as the dangerous variants of concern circulate. Countries must reprioritize testing and contact tracing at the primary care level to protect the lives and livelihoods of our people. We must also strongly advise those who are sick to isolate themselves to avoid getting others sick. 
Prioritizing prevention also means that we need to be proactive in our communication campaigns to remind younger working age populations of, of their risk and the need to protect themselves, including by getting vaccinated when it is their turn. But while vaccines are being rolled out as fast as possible, they are not a short-term solution. We cannot rely on vaccines to bring down infections when there's not enough vaccines to go around. Indeed, they are one part of the comprehensive response that includes prevention through public health measures and improving the readiness of health systems. And that's why we must do all we can to bend the curve, to bring infections down, to save lives, and to ensure access to vaccines. Thank you. Muchas gracias, doctora Etienne. Eh, vamos a pasar ahora a contestar las preguntas que nos han llegado, que nos están haciendo por el QIA. Recuerden eh, incluir su nombre y medio de comunicación cuando nos envían nuevas preguntas. Tenemos varias eh, preguntas de periodistas de varios países vinculados con las vacunas y con COVAX. Eh, para mencionar algunos, Daniel Colling de TN23 en Guatemala, Daniel Rodríguez de Canal 10 de Uruguay, Jacqueline Villeda de El Mundo del de Salvador, y también Gisela Salomón de AP y Kaylin Romero del Confidencial. Eh, empiezo con Kaylin Romero del Confidencial. Dice si ha habido avances con el Serum Institute eh, de India sobre el envío de vacunas y también cómo podría incidir en aquellos que requieren la segunda dosis de AstraZeneca. Eh, otros periodistas también preguntan con lo que está ocurriendo con el productor de AstraZeneca en, en Corea, cuál es el escenario de envío de otros lotes de vacunas eh, a países eh, como Guatemala, Bahamas, Barbados, México y Uruguay. Eh, también Jacqueline Villeda pregunta si se enviarán pre, eh, vacunas de Moderna a, a, a Latinoamérica si sabemos cuántas, a qué países y cuándo, y también Gisela Salomón de AP preguntar si están preparados los países para recibir estas vacunas de Moderna, teniendo en cuenta la necesidad de refrigeración para estas vacunas. Bueno, varias preguntas sobre este panorama. Doctor Barbosa, ¿podría contestar? Sí, gracias, gracias por las preguntas. Vamos ahí una por una. Eh, eh, to todavía se está en negociación con el gobierno de India, para que el Cero Institute de, de India pueda cumplir con sus contratos, los contratos que tiene con el mecanismo COVAX. El Cero Institute de India ha, uh, se ha comprometido a enviar uh, alrededor de, de un mil millones de dosis para el mecanismo COVAX, porque es un gran productor, pero con la situación que pasa ahora en India, el gobierno todavía no está autorizando el envío de dosis de, de ese productor. Hay una negociación de alto nivel que está el director general de la OMS y otros que están en negociación con el gobierno de India para intentar un acuerdo que India pueda autorizar una parte de la producción ser enviada para el mecanismo COVAX y otra parte se quedar en el país para las necesidades que tiene el propio país de vacunar su población. Eso puede incidir en, en todo el mundo, incluso en la región de, de América Latina y del Caribe, porque hay tres países de la región, Haití, Nicaragua y Bolivia, que tienen dosis que están eh, previstas para llegar hasta el final de, de mayo de este productor, de Cero Instituto de India, y, y también para todos los otros países puede haber eh, algunas implicaciones porque se va a reducir la, la oferta de vacunas por COVAX durante el mes de, de mayo y junio. Entonces es muy importante esa negociación de se buscar un acuerdo para que el Serum Instituto pueda entregar vacunas al gobierno de India, pero también cumplir con los contratos que tiene eh, con el mecanismo COVAX. Los otros países están a recibir las vacunas, ¿no? todos. Estamos ahora ya en el medio de la segunda, segunda ola de envío de vacunas para todos los países ¿no? y vamos a seguir. 
É, é bom recordar como se faz é, esta, é, esta distribuição. Temos uma lista de países que foi estabelecida por um mecanismo em Ginebra, que, que organizou a OMS e Gavi. Esse mecanismo, esse é como por um mecanismo aleatório, uma lista de países, e assim vamos a entregando as vacunas de acordo com essa lista. Há um comitê de expertos internacionais também em Ginebra, que faz uma supervisão para garantir a transparência. Então, nós outros, quando recebemos a lista e temos as negociações com os produtores para ter eh, a informação segura sobre a quantidade de vacunas que têm, vamos a entregando as vacunas e informando a los países quando vão chegar, que fecha, que quantidade, que voo, eh, etc. Por exemplo, Guatemala eh, recebeu a hora, é 28 de abril, 322 mil doses de vacunas e estamos em negociações já com os produtores para que Guatemala, assim como os outros países da região, possam receber as doses que estão faltando para completar eh, o que está, eh, lo que está assinado para eh, o período até o final de maio. Em caso de Guatemala, em concreto, tem mais 403 mil doses que estão aguardando. Eh, a última pergunta sobre Moderna. Moderna eh, anunciou essa semana uma, um acordo para entregar vacunas ao mecanismo COVAX. Essa é uma excelente notícia. São ao redor de 500 milhões de doses, mas somente eh, cerca de 36 milhões de doses se vão entregar este ano. As outras... 464 milhões de doses se vão entregar eh, no primeiro semestre do ano 2022. E sim, a grande maioria de los países da região tem condições de receber a vacuna de Moderna, porque é uma vacuna que necessita eh, se armazenar em condições de congelamento, que são semelhantes a outras vacunas que se utilizam já na região. Então, sim, estão eh, a grande maioria de los países listos para receber. Países de América Latina e do Caribe vão a receber vacunas de Moderna de todos os produtores. Né? Quando um produtor faz é, é, um acordo com o COVAX e entrega, em pé de entregar as vacunas, se vai distribuindo as vacunas, por exemplo, se tem 10 milhões de doses disponíveis para a primeira semana de junho, isso se vai distribuindo por todos os países de maneira equitativa, de maneira proporcional. Assim que também para a Moderna, Pfizer, que empeça a entregar a hora em junho para os países da América Latina, Janssen, que vai empezar provavelmente em mês de julho, ou seja, todos os produtores vão atender vacunas entregues para países da América Latina e do Caribe. Graças. Gracias, doctor. Eh, siguiente pregunta eh, es de Belisa Godinho de WHO, W Magazine perdón, en Portugal y también de Paula Lindo en, de Trinidad y Tobago Newsday. En inglés, eh, Belisa dice, How is the current situation on the new Indian eh, COVID variant in the Pajo region? Uh, e Paula Lindo diz: How important is it for a government to know how many cases of a particular variant of concern are present in a country? Dr. Alighieri? Yes, uh, thank you for this uh, questions, uh, both related to the, the genomic surveillance in the Americas. But uh, first, I'd like to provide you with some uh, background and update regarding how the genomic surveillance is working in the Americas. And I'd like first to note that uh, countries of this region have started years ago using the genomic surveillance for tracing outbreaks, cholera, foodborne diseases, chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever. And now this long, really long experience is applied to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, so at the moment, Uh, as of today, we have 15 countries and territories in the Americas with the capacity to do genome sequencing in at least one laboratory. Many countries have different laboratories in this, uh, doing genome sequencing. And very soon, two more countries will join this group of 15 countries uh, to uh, doing genomic uh, sequencing. In addition, 
during the last two months, we have been able to increase the number of regional reference laboratories from two, the Fiocruz in Brazil and Instituto de Salud Pública in Chile, to six, with now uh, four more laboratories joining this group, INDRE in Mexico, the Gorgas Institute in Panama, the USCDC in Atlanta, and the University of West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. The mission of these reference laboratories is to assist countries that have not reached a sequencing capacity yet. So they are processing the samples. PAO is coordinating the network, provides the countries and the laboratories with reagents, organized trainings, updates, and also covers the cost for shipment of the viral samples to the reference laboratories. Uh, for this important pillar of uh, the regional response to the pandemic, I'd like to highlight that we are receiving support from the US CDC and from the Rockefeller Foundation. Now regarding the question from Portugal, it is important to mention that the variant predominating now in India is named B1617 and has replaced previous variants that were circulating in this country, India. There is only a report of detection of one case of the B1617 in Mexico that has been reported to PAO through the International Air Regulation Channel. It hasn't been detected as of today in any other country of the region of the Americas. In Mexico, very important to mention that contact tracing activities are being implemented for uh, tracing this B1617 single case. So far, according to the WHO Working Group on Virus Evolution, the B1167 variant appears to be more transmissible, but there is no evidence so far indicating that it is more aggressive or severe. Now, regarding the second question from the colleague in Trinidad and Tobago. It's really important to maintain the genomic surveillance fully articulated with the epidemiology called surveillance in order to detect any unusual or unexpected increase in cases, increase in lethality, or change in clinical patterns, because these aspects may be associated to a particular variant. Nevertheless, once a variant is detected in a particular area of the country or a particular country and the transmission is established, it is not necessary to keep counting all cases corresponding to the same variant. The most important aspect is to monitor the proportion of the newly, newly detected variant among laboratory confirmed cases. So I hope that I have answered both the concerns of the two journalists and also provided you with an update regarding the regional network uh, for genomic surveillance in the region of the Americas. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Um, siguiente pregunta es de Carrie Khan de NPR en los Estados Unidos eh, y similar también nos envió una pregunta eh, Kaylin Romero del Confidencial en Nicaragua. Eh, Carrie Khan en inglés la pregunta eh, dice How reliable are the COVID-19 figures that we are getting from the Nicaraguan government at this time? Eh, has the government implemented bajo recommended practices? And if not, what is PAHO recommending Nicaragua to do to manage the, the pandemic? Dr. Ugarte. Thank you for this question. Um, in order to do a comprehensive risk assessment in all the countries in the region, PAHO uses official information that is channeled through the international health regulations, uh, information that is provided officially by the countries. We also use other reliable sources of information. We, we also look for information that is published in the media and also use information on the neighboring countries as to analyze what are the trends and the situation, particularly border areas. So with all that, 
we uh, we analyze the situation and we can report on what is happening inside the country. As you well know, there are discrepancies between the official reports and other sources. Uh, but even considering the official reports, uh, we can see an increase of number of cases in the last uh, week. Uh, and it's a trend that is being happening uh, from uh, some days before. And uh, in that regards, we have been working with the government of Nicaragua and other partners. And our recommendations are being implemented in several areas, not only uh, by the government, but also by other partners, as I said. And we think that this uh, process will uh, help Nicaragua to control the pandemic in a better way. So we emphasize on the detection of cases. We emphasize on the surveillance uh, and uh, uh, monitoring of the cases, but also the contacts to implement social distancing and other public health measures, and also to vaccinate the priority groups. So all that information uh, must be available for the population to take the, the proper measures but also for international community to continue supporting Nicaragua with the donation of vaccines or other means of support for the Nicaraguan population. So this is a joint work and we expect that this work will be better as we go forward. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Eh, ahora me gustaría darle la palabra a Kadim Joseph de Observer Media en Antigua y en Barbuda para que haga su pregunta. Kadim, uh, you have the floor. Uh, good morning and thanks for having me. Uh, my question is, in recent days, residents here in Antigua and Barbuda have been debating the prospect of mandating COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, what is the what is PAHO's stance on making COVID-19 vaccinations mandatory in order to reach herd immunity as well as offering incentives like food vouchers to encourage people to get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Kadim. Dr. Barbosa. Thank you, Kadim, for this, <clears throat> this question. Uh, PAHO does not recommend the use of uh, uh, mandatory measures or vouchers to, uh, to encourage people to get vaccinated. Of course, that this is a decision that uh, every country uh, can make. But uh, in our perspective, the most important measure to guarantee that the people will get vaccinated is to provide the right information to the families, to the communities. So this is very important that each Ministry of Health needs to develop a very comprehensive communication plan. Uh, it's very important to reach out to every physician, nurse, uh, health worker in, in, in the country explaining what are the benefits of the vaccine, why people should be vaccinated. So when a family or a person goes to a doctor for any other reason and he has some doubts about a vaccine, can ask it to the nurse, to the physician, and receive the proper uh, information. It is also very important to use not only the traditional media vehicles, but to use the social media, to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other vehicles to provide the right information to the people. We believe that this is the best way to encourage people to get vaccinated, to show clearly the benefits to get vaccinated, that the vaccines are saving lives already and can protect uh, you, your family, and your community. This is a, a very important measure that every country needs to, to have as a priority in their national develop, uh, national uh, vaccination plan. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. La siguiente pregunta es de uh, Steven Civilian de PGD2 Radio in San Martin. Uh, dice in inglés, is PAHO happy with the COVID-19 management put in place by Caribbean countries in the fight against the virus? Dr. Alighieri. Thank you, Mr. Sirelia, for this question regarding the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean is a mosaic of people, islands, mainland countries, and also a mosaic of economies. But it's also a mosaic of different patterns of transmission of the COVID-19. 
The unique situation of the Caribbean is that its economy depends on tourism, therefore on international travels. And I would say that it is the, this is the most important aspect, complex aspect of the response in the region of the Caribbean. As in all South America, as in many countries of Central America, the Caribbean region is facing now a new surge of cases. This surge has started late 2020, early 2021, following the resuming of non-essential travels to the Caribbean islands, and also related later to the spillover of the new wave in the Northern Amazon to the countries of the Guyanese shield, namely Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana. Countries of the Caribbean uh, during 2020 have used very efficiently public health measures including lockdown and travel bans for bending the curve. The countries have strengthened their surveillance systems, including the laboratory surveillance. All countries and almost all territories have implemented their own PCR diagnostic. Many of them are using antigen rapid tests as part of their testing strategy. So this was 2020. In 2021, all countries in the French, Dutch, and English-speaking Caribbean have started rolling out of vaccination response activities, sourcing vaccines through different mechanisms, bilateral deals, diplomatic agreements, COVAX mechanisms, and some countries are progressing very quickly in administering the vaccine to a large uh, part of the population. This is an example that all countries must follow. I'd like also to highlight our special concern regarding the complex humanitarian emergency that is occurring in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, with a high proportion of people that are internally displaced following the eruptions of La Soufrière volcano. The population living in shelters are at risk for COVID-19 infections, higher risk of COVID-19 infections. So in conclusion, in this mosaic of epidemiological situations, Caribbean countries and territories have experience and have access to all the tools for bending the curve and saving lives. The combination of public health and travel related measures, very strictly implemented, very strictly monitored, and also a proactive vaccination program is key for controlling the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in the Caribbean region. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Eh, tenemos varias preguntas eh, vinculadas con Venezuela, eh, por mencionar algunos periodistas, Oswin Barrios de Radio Fe y Alegría, Mariana de Barrios de TV Venezuela y Gabriel Bastidas de monitoreamos.com preguntan similar sobre eh, Venezuela y COVAX. Eh, preguntan si OPS pudo recibir el segundo pago de Venezuela correspondiente a las vacunas COVAX y cuándo podrían llegar a Venezuela. Doctor Ugarte. Gracias por, por eh, eh, esas preguntas que aparecen en el chat, pero eh, también por esta pregunta específica relacionada a COVAX. La, la OPS eh, no recibe el pago para, para COVAX, es un pago que se hace eh, directamente a Gavi o eh, que es donde se hace el acuerdo. Y efectivamente, la OPS cuando hace eh, la compra de las vacunas puede recibir el pago para, para esa porción. En ese sentido, el segundo pago eh, que, que Venezuela eh, haría directamente a, a Gavi se ha anunciado públicamente, no tenemos confirmación de ese pago. Eh, esperamos todos que ese pago sea, se haga efectivo pronto y con eso eh, Venezuela podría eh, ser elegible para la siguiente, el siguiente plan de distribución de vacunas. Eh, esas vacunas eh, van a ser a, analizadas por eh, el grupo asesor y luego el, el grupo de decisión de COVAX eh, y dependiendo del tipo de vacuna y las cantidades de vacunas se le informará a los países, entre ellos a Venezuela. Eh, respecto a los tiempos, no hay tiempos precisos. Eh, se prevé, sin embargo, que sería eh, a finales de junio, eh, julio 
todos esperamos que sea antes. Eh, sabemos que las restricciones de la producción de vacunas y el incremento de casos en, en los países productores está reduciendo la disponibilidad de vacunas para el resto de países, incluyendo Venezuela, que es efectivamente uno de los países que tiene menores eh, eh, cantidades de vacunas por, por población. En ese sentido, reiteramos nuestro eh, llamado a todos los actores para facilitar el acceso de las vacunas para la población venezolana, para el personal de salud de primera línea, para el personal crítico, las personas con comorbilidades, y al mismo tiempo, eh, debido a que eh, las vacunas no van a estar disponibles en cantidades suficientes, implementar las medidas de salud pública que han demostrado su eficacia y efectividad durante todos estos meses. Gracias. Gracias, doctor. La siguiente pregunta nos llegó de Sara eh, Jerping eh, de Devic sobre lo que eh, habló la directora hoy sobre la situación en las unidades de cuidados intensivos en hospitales de, de la región. En inglés, la pregunta de Sara dice, Can you please say which countries are you most concerned about in the region in terms of health systems becoming overwhelmed? Doctora Etienne. So thank you, Sara, for this question. Frankly, we are concerned about all of the countries in our region and because they all face difficult prospects. We have analyzed the impact on hospital services of the COVID pandemic over the last year in some 16 countries. In March of 2020, they had 61,406 ICU beds with an average occupancy rate of some 61%. By April of this year, these countries had already expanded to 121,000 ICU beds. But importantly, about 80% of these increased ICU beds were occupied. And, and that's an average. But some countries had more than 95% occupancy rates in their intensive care units. So, Despite a significant expansion in capacity, hospitals have quickly filled up again as, as more people fall seriously ill with COVID-19. With increased numbers of younger patients and the longer hospital stays in some countries like Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Peru, the needs for ICU bed, as I mentioned earlier, increases. And let's face it, it's not only beds that we need to care for people. As I've said before, each of these beds requires highly trained doctors and nurses with knowledge of intensive care and the specialized nurses who can care for these very ill patients 24 hours a day. This is intense care. So the strain on our human resources has been unprecedented. And Frankly, we don't yet see the light at the end of the tunnel. Medical oxygen is vital for many of these severe and critical patients. And we have in PAHO, we have mounted a major effort to support the surge capacity in these countries. Patients in critical care need oxygen. And the longer they stay in hospital, the more oxygen they need. And all hospitals are hard pressed to keep up with that increased demand for oxygen. Our countries have managed to double their intensive care capacity, but this may not be sustainable over time. Quality standards and patient safety depend on adequate, well-trained personnel and equipment. And I, I need to say I'm personnel that are not overstretched as well. Uh, These both are suffering on the strain of the increased cases in most countries. And at the same time, we have also seen disruptions to outpatient services and the other normal disease prevention activities. The first level of care, the at primary care level, has been predominantly affected, and this has implications for vulnerable populations. But you know, we cannot yield to these difficulties. 
We are supporting the countries in vital areas, including the procurement of medications and supplies, oxygen management strategies, the deployment of rapid tests to improve surveillance and response, um, provide, um, supporting in, in sourcing other supplies and in some other areas. We are also supporting countries in expansion of their hospital capacity, including the search capacity, such as with the emergency medical teams and alternative medical care sites where appropriate. I want to assure you that we will continue to work together so that countries can overcome these obstacles. But the challenges are unprecedented. However, we must get through this pandemic for an eventual return to, model, to normalcy. So we all must play an important part. Over. Thanks. Gracias, eh, doctor Etienne. <clears throat> Siguiente pregunta es de Michael Stott eh, del Financial Times. Dice, the United States is a major partner in PAHO and the richest country in the hemisphere, but very few vaccine doses have arrived in Latin America from the United States. Uh, and yet when India had a recent crisis, the US offered help immediately. What should the US be doing to help Latin America and the Caribbean get hold of vaccines now? Dr. Barbosa. Thank you for this question. It is very important that the, the US, the European Union, and other developed countries in the world uh, could provide more support to the developing countries. I think that this is really not only an ethical and moral imperative, but uh, from a public health perspective, if we want to control the transmission, we need to work everywhere. Uh, we need to support every country to get the access to more vaccines, to get the access to the medicines and they need medicines in order to, uh, to respond in each country to the pandemic. The, the US has recently announced the 2.2 billion dollars donation to COVAX. This was a very important step. It was the first donation from the US to the COVAX facility. Uh, and also when we had, uh, we are still having a, a very important crisis in Brazil related to medicines that are used in the ICU, some ICU procedures, uh, the Pan-American Health Organization is uh, working with the US government and the Brazilian government to facilitate a donation from the US to Brazil. So I think that these are uh, first steps but the, our director has sent a letter to the U.S. government asking the U.S. government if they could uh, donate some vaccines that they will not use to countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I think that it's very welcome, this participation of the U.S. in the response, because it, they are, uh, the U.S. is a, a very important country, the, rich, the richest country in the world with so many resources and indeed, I think that if they can exercise more this solidarity with the neighboring countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, for sure that this will be very important, a very important support to these countries. And we need to welcome uh, all initiatives to support the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Um, siguiente pregunta es de Kevin Felmine de Guardian Media en Trinidad y Tobago. Uh, va a ser en inglés. Um, describe un poco la situación de restricciones en su país y pregunta, uh, since the pandemic began, have lockdowns or shutdown of businesses activities shown to help decrease the spread of COVID-19? If so, uh, please explain how it helps. Uh, y también dice, given the frightening situation in India, should Trinidad and Tobago run out of bed spaces or consumables? Will PAHO be able to assist the country in navigating through such a disaster? If yes, how can PAHO help? Dr. Aldigeri. Thanks a lot for this question regarding the situation in uh and response in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, first, please note that uh, the mission of the Pan-American Health Organization is to assist countries during peacetime and also during uh, pandemic time. Uh, yes, we can help. Uh, 
I'd like uh, to note that the Ministry of Health of Trinidad and Tobago reports uh, to PARO on a daily basis, cases and death through the International Health Regulation Channel. As of yesterday, uh, Trinidad and Tobago has reported an accumulated uh, number of uh, 11,471 cases and accumulated number of 179 deaths from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, what we have noticed and that uh, the Minister of Health has uh, reported during the last weeks is that trends have increased dramatically in terms of new cases and death. So at this moment of a pandemic, in many Caribbean countries and in all South American countries, the public health measures, including lockdown, are the main tools for bending the epidemiological curve. The public health measures, when strictly implemented and strictly monitored, will have an impact on the reproductive rate of the epidemic. And therefore, this will help to reduce the number of severe cases and decrease the burden on health services, including intensive care units. But I'd like also to highlight the efforts and the hard work of the Ministry of Health in Trinidad and Tobago in strengthening the surveillance system, including the laboratory surveillance, which is coordinated by the TPHL, and including now with the participation of the University of West Indies for genomic surveillance of the virus SARS-CoV-2. So in Trinidad, there is this capacity of genomic surveillance. So how PAO can help? PAO has developed tools, technical guidelines, procurement mechanisms for assisting countries facing a new peak of transmission. It includes the management of uh, oxygen, including the oxygen supply chain, the use and the access to ICU medications, intubation, intubation medications, personal protection equipments, but also guidelines for organization of health services, including stepping up primary healthcare interventions in order to lower the impact on uh, hospital uh, beds. So PAO, through its country office and team in Porto Spain, is totally engaged for assisting the Ministry of Health and also with the, the strong connections to the uh, PAO HQ Operation Center based in Washington, DC. So I hope I have answered the concern of the journalist of the Guardian. Thanks a lot. Gracias, doctor. Eh, siguiente pregunta viene de Katia Rojas Toro de Destino Panamá y también de Gerson Collave del Comercio en Perú sobre vacunación en adolescentes. Dicen que es probable que se autoricen a, eh, algunas vacunas para, para adolescentes en los próximos días por parte de agencias regulatorias de Europa y Estados Unidos. Eh, y preguntan cuál es la posición de la OPS OMS con respecto a la inmunización de jóvenes de 12 a 16 años contra COVID-19 en la región. Doctor Barbosa. Gracias, gracias por la pregunta. Mira, es, es positivo que se están ampliando los estudios para confirmar que las vacunas contra la COVID-19 puedan también ser seguras y efectivas para adolescentes y niños. Eso, eso es muy bueno porque eh, significa que en algún momento en el futuro, cuando se, se va a utilizar esas vacunas, ya vamos a tener datos para confirmar que son seguras y, y también eh, eficaces para, para esos grupos. Eh, pero es importante, primero, que las autoridades reguladoras dicen que se puede utilizar, no dicen que deben utilizar, quem dizem que deve utilizar são os que fazem os planos de imunização. Ou seja, em cada país, os ministérios da saúde estão com seus planos de, de vacunação para toda a população. A recomendação da OMS e da OPS é utilizar essas vacunas para, primeiro, para salvar vidas e para manter os serviços de saúde funcionando. Vacunas se podem utilizar para distintos objetivos. 
em no momento que vivemos com o acesso limitado às vacunas, a prioridade deve ser para os profissionais de saúde e os outros profissionais de áreas sociais que estão em na linha de frente, de maneira a que os hospitais, centros de saúde, os serviços essenciais possam seguir funcionando. Segundo, salvar vidas, proteger a los mais vulneráveis que têm o maior risco de desenvolver uma forma grave de la COVID-19 de morrer. São os adultos maiores e os adultos que têm alguma condição de saúde, uma enfermidade crônica, hipertensão, diabetes, câncer, obesidade e outras, que podem ser um fator de risco para uma forma grave e para morrer por la COVID-19. Então, esse é o objetivo principal. Só depois que se alcança isso, é que se deve ir ampliando o acesso à vacuna para que se alcance uma cobertura vacunal em uma comunidade muito elevada. Assim que essa é a recomendação da OMS e da OPS, não, não recomendamos é, utilizar vacunas em adolescentes e nesse momento, é, primeiro porque todavia não há, é, não estão finalizados os estudos sobre a segurança e sobre a segurança e a eficácia, e também porque não são grupos prioritários. Como falou nossa diretora ao princípio, é, com esse objetivo de salvar vidas, é que se deve utilizar as vacunas nesse momento. As vacunas não vão atender, em curto prazo, um efeito sobre a transmissão da Covid-19. Por isso, se deve combinar a vacuna para proteger os vulneráveis e salvar vidas com as medidas de saúde pública que podem, é, que podem diminuir a velocidade da transmissão. Graças. Gracias, doctor. La próxima pregunta en inglés es del Miami Herald de Jacqueline Charles. Eh, son varias preguntas. Dice, of the vaccines that have been distributed, what percentage has gone to Latin America and the Caribbean? Also, uh, Pajo has said 500 million people in Latin America and the Caribbean need to be vaccinated to reach her immunity. At the current rate of vaccination, what is the estimate on when that will be reached. And finally, what's the status of vaccine deliveries to Haiti? Uh, Dr. Barbosa? Okay, many questions. Let me let me be very brief. Let me start by the end. We Haiti has not received the enforcement uh, vaccines through COVAX. Haiti has seven around 700,000 vaccines that uh, were allocated to Haiti, but the government of Haiti Haiti is still in the process to finalize the, the arrangements that the, all the other countries have made to be able to receive these vaccines. Haiti is one of the 10 AMC supported countries in the region, so Haiti is not paying for these vaccines, but the country needs to make some legal and, and administrative arrangements. Our country office in Haiti is supporting the Ministry of Health to get everything ready to receive these vaccines. Uh, the second is that the, the, the access to vaccines is very limited during the first semester. In the second semester, we, we will have more vaccines, but uh, I think that is too early to make any kind of, uh, of uh, estimation about when the countries will reach the 70 or 80% that uh, we, we think that uh, will provide the herd immunity. I think that is too early to, to make this kind of estimation. The main objective now is to get more vaccines to reach the 20% of the population that, uh, that will include all the most vulnerable groups that need to be reached as soon as possible in every country. Uh, third, the, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, has received so far around 15% or 15% of the total vaccines that COVAX has deployed. But the, every country in Latin America and the Caribbean will receive by the end of May uh, around 2.2% of their population, as well as all the other uh, countries that participate in COVAX facilities. So every country in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean are receiving exactly the same proportion of their population, around 2.2%. 
the, ex the exception is uh, are the, the small islands in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, that they have a, a, a small population. So for logistical reasons, they are receiving uh, around the 16, 15, 20% of their population. So the COVAX is providing an equitable access to all the countries based on their population and the ratio that they requested to the facility. Some countries requested 20%, other countries 10%, but, but all of them are receiving a similar proportion of the vaccines. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Todavía nos quedan algunas preguntas, así que les agradecemos. Nos vamos a extender un poco algunos minutos hoy, seguramente en la sesión. La siguiente pregunta es de Melina Ochoa. Eh, quisiera darle el piso a Melina, si nos estás escuchando, para hacer tu pregunta. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenos días. ¿Me escuchan? Sí, adelante. Sí. Muchas gracias. Saludos a todos desde la Ciudad de México. Eh, una duda entre la población mexicana es que en el hecho de, de que ya circulan nuevas variantes de preocupación como la sudafricana o de interés como la detectada en la India. Entonces, ¿cómo debe interpretar esto la población mexicana? ¿Hay que eh, redoblar esfuerzos con las medidas sanitarias? Eh, ¿O todavía estas este, variantes no significan algo más peligroso que la propia pandemia? Gracias. Gracias, Melina. Doctor Aldigieri. Sí, eh, gracias, señora Ochoa, por su, su pregunta. So, eh, voy, voy a empezar por un, uh, un tema que yo creo hemos tocado varias veces. Es que la aparición de variantes es un proceso normal, biológico y esperado como un mecanismo de evolución del virus. Si bien algunas de esas variantes han demostrado tener una mayor capacidad de transmisión, no existe hasta el momento evidencia para inferir que pueden ser más agresivas o más letales. Hasta el momento, todas las medidas de control que han sido implementadas, tales uso de mascarilla, distanciamiento social y la vacunación, han demostrado ser eficientes para detener la transmisión de cualquier variante. Ahora bien, en México, el INDRE lidera una red de vigilancia genómica a nivel nacional que ha permitido detectar de manera oportuna variantes circulando en el país. Y muy posiblemente van a detectar otras variantes que van a... a ser importadas o variantes que pueden aparecer en el país mismo. So, México, a través de su red nacional, tiene la capacidad para detectar, para secuenciar y para comparar las variantes detectadas que circulan en el país con las bases de datos internacionales. Se confirmaron uh, la variante de preocupación inicialmente detectada en Gran Bretaña, la variante de interés detectada que se inició en México mismo y uh, la variante de interés en la India. Y se está informando a la comunidad internacional a través de los canales establecidos en el Reglamento Sanitario Internacional. Pero yo uh, quisiera destacar que de manera simultánea las autoridades sanitarias en México informaron en ruedas de prensa sobre los riesgos a la población para evitar cualquier pánico y para que se tomen medidas preventivas en la comunidad. Se valoraron los casos y se investigaron los potenciales brotes asociados con las diferentes variantes, incluyendo la variante uh, de interés uh, primero detectado en la India. Y para este caso uh, de la, la, la nueva detección, se están rastreando los contactos para aislarlos. Uh, y es importante mencionar que uh, el equipo OPS en México está en contacto permanente con las contrapartes, incluyendo la Secretaría de Salud, pero no únicamente, y se está recomendando seguir informando en la población y reactivar una campaña de prevención y el cumplimiento de las medidas barreras. So, espero, espero haber respondido a, a su pregunta, señora Ochoa. Gracias. 
Gracias, doctor. Últimas preguntas de la sesión de hoy. La siguiente es de Anthony Boal de Reuters en Brasil. En inglés dice, eh, Brazil's health regulator and visa did not improve the importing of the Sputnik V vaccine, arguing that it contained replicating adenovirus. Russia says no replication competent adenovirus was found in any of the Sputnik V vaccine batches that were produced. Uh, who is right in this matter, or is it a case of different levels of um, RCA that are permissible? Dr. Barbosa? Thank you for this question, because it will allow me, allow me to, to explain very briefly what's the role of the national health regulatory authorities and what's the role of WHO uh, about the recommendation authorization of vaccines. Each country has sovereign uh, right to, to make the assessment of the vaccines and medicines and to, to give a license to them. So Anvisa in Brazil and other authorities in, in Latin America and Caribbean and even in the US or Canada, they are re reviewing all the the dossiers that the producers present and make their decisions based on the analysis that they perform about these dossiers. They don't need and they don't consult PAHO or WTO to make this assessment. What we do, PAHO, uh, is to support the development and the strength of the national regulatory capacities. Since uh, almost 20 years now, we perform regular assessment of the national health regulatory authorities in the Americas. And the, from this assessment, we can establish a plan of action to support them to, to strengthen their regulatory capacities. Anvisa is one of the eight regulatory authorities of reference that we, we have in the Americas. So they, they made the assessment and they give the reasons uh, about their decision. WHO, uh, has a pre-qualification team in Geneva, and the, uh, this team can give a pre-qualification to a vaccine or a medicine, or in the case that we have now during the pandemic, they give a emergency, uh, emergency use listing. So they, they give the, 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 the authorization for these vaccines to be used during the pandemic. PAHO, uh, through the revolving fund, We only purchase the vaccines that they have authorization, this uh, emergency authorization from WHO. The Gamaleya Institute uh, had an initial contact with the pre-qualification team in Geneva, and the, they said that they will provide information about the, the Sputnik vaccine to WHO. So we can only say anything about the Sputnik vaccine after the WHO pre-qualification team has received all the information and make the, the assessment about the quality of production, the safety and the, and the efficacy of the vaccine. So in short, we cannot say anything about what we don't know. Uh, only after this assessment by WHO, we can say uh, what is the situation of the Sputnik vaccine. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Ya estamos llegando al final de la sesión de prensa de hoy. Eh, última pregunta eh, vinculada con las vacunas eh, que nos han hecho llegar. Dice en inglés, eh, figures show that some countries are vaccinating large numbers, but other countries barely have enough for 2% of their population. Some people only want certain vaccines and some people and health workers are reluctant to be vaccinated. And what do you say to those people, Dr. Aetien? Thank, thank you for this question. I think we should make a very important point um, that COVID-19 is easily transmitted. It seems this is even uh, worse with some of the variants of concern. And this can lead to long-term serious illness and death even for people who are young and healthy. Effective COVID-19 vaccines exist and are one important way to protect people from this disease. You heard um, Dr. Barbosa. We still do not have enough doses of COVID-19 vaccines 
for the entire population in Latin America and the Caribbean. We need more vaccines and we are advocating at the highest levels for increased supplies from manufacturers, for donations from countries that have excess vaccines. We and PAHO, we consider that our frontline health workers, we consider them as the highest priority for vaccination because they are at the high, higher risk of being infected with COVID-19. And, and there is also a risk that they can spread COVID-19 to people like, 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 like their patients, their families, people who are also at high risk of complications or death. I, I think it's important to note that our health workers have been working under intense and challenging conditions for more than a year. And, and they put themselves at really higher risk to help others as part of the COVID-19 response. And health workers are especially important for immunization because they constitute the most trusted source of information on vaccination. So we, we really have to work with our healthcare workers to ensure that they fully understand um, all that there is about COVID-19 vaccines and that they are able to um, be a source of information. We want to urge them to listen to people's concerns, to acknowledge them and to correct any misinformation, rumors or misperceptions that are circulating and, and to emphasize the safety of the vaccines and their benefits in preventing diseases. But of course, to, be, to do that, um, they themselves have to be convinced. They have to avail themselves of the information and our ministries of health supported by PAHO, we have to work particularly with those who are on the um, front line of distributing of vaccines. So I understand that people may have questions about the COVID vaccines or of course, they might have seen things online or in the news that make them question whether they or their family members should get these vaccines. I, I understand wanting to make sure that you are making the best decision. And I think that is commendable. But let me take this opportunity to reassure you again that the vaccines will protect you against needlessly suffering from COVID or dying from COVID and they are safe. So how do we know this, that they are safe? Vaccine safety is always a top priority. All vaccines go through the same process of trial phases before they can be approved for use in the population. And these trial phases aim to ensure the safety of the vaccine if and how well it can protect against the disease and other aspects like the number of doses that will be required and who um, should be vaccinated. The vaccines that have been approved by WHO who have received the emergency use listing that Dr. Barbosa referred to, they are safe and they do protect us against COVID. Yes, we have heard informally that some healthcare workers, especially in the Caribbean, are worried about vaccines due to the same myths and concerns that have circulated in the general public. We continue to work with ministries of health and communication specialists to really understand these concerns about getting vaccinated and to work with healthcare communities and healthcare leaders to improve vaccine uptake, to dispel those myths and to urge everyone to get vaccinated as soon as they are eligible and as soon as vaccines are available. So let me end by reminding you that the best vaccine is the one that's available and offered to you. We encourage people not to wait for your preferred vaccine. And remember, vaccines are only part of the preventive effort at this particular time with the limited doses, we need to rely on the other public health measures of physical distancing, the wearing of masks, the not congregating in closed um, environments. And countries, authorities 
have to look at other more uh, um, conditions or other more um, interventions like lockdowns and, and more restrictions. Let us each take a responsibility for ending this pandemic. Let's do our part. Thank you. Muchas gracias, doctora Etienne. Ahora sí, entonces hemos llegado al final de nuestra sesión de hoy. Recuerden que pueden encontrar más información sobre la COVID-19 en la página web de la OPS. También allí pueden encontrar la última alerta epidemiológica que comentábamos hoy sobre el incremento de las hospitalizaciones y las defunciones en pacientes menores de 60 años, así como información sobre la entrega de, de vacunas por COVAX y sobre la vacunación en general. Así que, bueno, nuevamente muchas gracias por acompañarnos en la sesión de hoy y nos vemos el próximo miércoles. Saludos a todos.